Hi guys, how you doing? I just wanted to give you an update on the Southwest hedging case study and wanted to sort of go through this case study with you guys step by step to give you some instructions over video so that you can have a little bit of an easier look into what's going on here. So if you want, go ahead, open up the file called the Southwest business case study, the background. And what I want to go over is first, what are they talking about in the introduction? So this is the introduction piece. And we're trying to figure out here um, with Scott here, who's the director of corporate finance at Southwest Airlines. And he's concerned about the cost of fuel for Southwest. The idea is that the fuel cost has been high ever since the industry, the fuel industry has been deregulated in 1978. And the airline profitability and survival depends on controlling costs. After labor, jet fuel is the second largest cost for airlines. And if airlines can control the cost of fuel, they can more accurately estimate budgets and forecast earnings. So what's the idea here is from a business perspective, we're looking to control cost. So it's very much in the cost accounting realm of what we're trying to do here. And you know, this guy is the finance guy, and he's saying here the quote of the whole case study here is it says, if we don't hedge jet fuel price risk, we are speculating. It is our fiduciary, fiduciary duty to try and hedge this risk. So just coming into it and saying, you know, from a business perspective, not engaging in hedging, he's saying is speculation. In a way, you know, a lot of people say when you trade derivatives or when you, you know, you're running a portfolio of derivatives, you're speculating. But in this case, in this case, you're actually speculating if you don't do that. Because, you know, I want you guys to think about what is the intention of hedging. The intention of hedging is to be risk neutral, right? So if you own jet fuel, right, and, and jet fuel may rise in price next year, you're not risk neutral. You're risk on because you're long on jet fuel. So if jet fuel price goes up, so does risk, the cost risk. If you are gonna buy jet fuel, but you have a derivative that says you're also gonna sell jet fuel, you're risk neutral. Because you're like, well, you know, jet fuel price could go up, but it doesn't matter to me because whatever happens, I'm even because I'm gonna buy jet fuel and I'm gonna sell jet fuel. So that's, you know, in a way, now you're not speculating because you cut out any downside to fuel prices going up. And in a way, that's what chapter nine, which is, has to do with accounting for fair value and cash flow hedges, is all about. But this is the business application of it. And I wanna keep going here and go through the part of volatility of jet fuel if you go to figure one, I want you guys to look at a chart. This is the chart of crude oil trading throughout from 1994 to 2001. And you could see during 9-11, the spike in crude oil where it started trading on almost $125 per barrel. So in a way, the first thing in this case study you wanna do is you really look at this chart and, and say, listen, what happens to the Southwest income statement if jet fuel starts going from $20 to $5 a barrel as it was in 1999 to $125 per barrel, which it was in 2001? So we're talking about quadrupling your cost with no additional revenue. So just get comfortable with this chart and be like, oh, well, what we're trying to do is get rid of this extreme cost risk. Because in the airline industry, there's no way you could pass that risk on and have your customers pay for this extra charge because airline tickets are so competitive. So in a way, this is where we start. Continuing with Southwest Airlines, guys, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Southwest and the company itself. So the business aspect of Southwest here, we're seeing it formed in 1971 by Rolling King and Herb Keller. 
and the airline began three Boeing 737s operation, just flying three planes in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. And their simple strategy was if you get your passengers to the destination when they want to get there on time at the lowest possible fares and make darn sure they have a good time doing it, people will fly your airline. So this strategy has been the key to Southwest success. And they've been winning these triple crowns where they have the best on-time record, best baggage handling, and fewer and fewest customer complaints. It's called the Triple Crown. They won five annual Triple Crowns in 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96. So they're on a roll here. So they're, they're basically a top quality airline and they're using innovation and they're using different things to get things to, to align all to this mission, which is to get people there on time with no problems with the lowest possible fare, you know? And this is how they're staying competitive. And by 2000, which is when, when we're jumping into this, they are the fourth largest U.S. carrier based on domestic passengers. So they have 344 Boeing 737 planes. So they are basically really made it in this airline industry based on customer service and based on delivering high quality service for the lowest amount of, amount of money. Right, so that's their thing, and now what we're getting into is they have now delved, they're one of the few airline companies that delved into the world of financial derivatives and the world of hedging, the finance world, and they try to master that world, and you could kind of see where the work that we're going to do now, where it comes from, sort of the culture of the company is to be very detailed and very effective and stick to their values and their mission. So you see now a lot of the derivative work we're going to get into, you'll see that some companies didn't get into that world, you know, and they didn't have their planes on time and they didn't really perform all the extra things you need to be to be a good airline. So you could see sort of the, in the background why they are so involved in this sort of, in this derivative world. So moving on here, we have the hedging part of this piece and what's going on with risk management. So w the one thing we need to go next is how come, how are they hedging, how are they hedging the fuel and what is the top way to do it? So the one, the thing that I want to focus on in this project with you guys is future and forward contracts. Future and forward contracts only we're not going to go into the other derivatives. This is the contract that I want to study in Chapter 9. This is the contract that is studied in the text. The only difference between a future contract and a forward contract is that futures are used for commodities and they're exchange traded, and forwards are used for currencies and they're not exchange traded in a way. So it's the same exact thing. All it is is an agreement to get a delivery of something in the future. So if you're buying an oil future, I just want to get some oil in the future. You're buying euros, I just want to get euros in the future. What does it mean? I make an agreement today to get something in the future. Right? So how does it used for hedging? You know, this is sort of the preferred way of hedging jet fuel. And why is it like that? Well, Think about it. If you're going to be buying jet fuel next year, you're going to be buying jet fuel next year. What's the whole idea of why we're doing this whole thing? Well, think back to figure one. If you go back, if you go back to figure one, you know, we're going to try to see, you know, how does oil trade here? What's, what's the trading nature of oil? And it looks like the volatility is so high that next year oil may cost us double or triple, right? So you want to look on the Southwest income statement. You know, try to correlate. Say, oh, jet fuel cost us 500000 last year. Okay. What would happen if it cost double but income remained the same? Okay, it looks like we have no income now. We're in the negative. So this is where it starts being impactful because you're like, okay, if we don't hedge this volatility out as we're heading into 9-11 here, if we don't hedge any of this out, 
then income will be negative, right? So what does that mean for an airline, negative income? Basically means you're deteriorating, you can't pay your bills, you know? And once you get there, you know, you have to start thinking like a real business person. You can't pay your bills, you know? That means, you know, the planes, I can't afford fixing the planes, okay? Can't afford fixing the planes. All right, well, you can't afford to have, to be flying the planes then, okay? Like, it's very, very quick, especially with airlines, that risk area where, you, you know, you don't have the money, but, you know, now you can't compromise the safety. Okay, so you got to lay off the people, and then, and then the culture is not the same. Nobody feels safe anymore, and then, and then you know, that's how quickly things change. So what's going to happen here is that you want to hedge that out. And when are you getting the jet fuel? You're getting the jet fuel in a year. So, how do you hedge it? You make an agreement to sell jet fuel in a year. So, what does that mean? So, if I'm going to buy $2 million worth, 2 million barrels of jet fuel in a year, I know that because I need that for my planes. And oil is trading at 50. So, I make an agreement to buy oil when the price is 50. So, that price in the, f the future price, say, will be like 60. So, I make an agreement to buy it at the future rate. So already, in a way, I'm locking in the rate. In a way, I'm locking in the rate. Or, or I make an agreement to sell jet fuel in the future. And this is basically where the financial hedge happens. If I make an agreement to sell jet fuel in the future, right now, in 1999, you have to understand, the future contracts to sell oil in two years traded at around 45 because nobody knew that we were going to have 9-11. So everybody said, oh, listen, oil is trading at 45 in a year. Oil will trade at like 50. Like, no, no big deal. We didn't know. We didn't know oil was going to trade at 100. So the future contract basically gives you the ability to sell oil at 100. So you're going to profit from having this contract, right? But you're going to be neutral because that profit is going to cancel out the fact that you're now buying $100 worth of oil because that's your demand for your own um, airplanes. The contract is just going to hedge out that risk. So in a way, forward contracts is just a way to benefit from prices going up. It's how you benefit from the fact that the price is going up. is Because it's not that we knew the price was going to go up when we bought the forward. When we bought it, we thought that, you know, the price of it thought that it's going to stay the same. You know, should it go up, we make money on the forward, and we lose money on the fact that we just need to buy expensive jet fuel. That's the hedge. That's the hedge. And next, we're going to get into figuring it out how the hedge is actually affecting the financial statements of Southwest. With um, the Southwest hedging, guys, now I wanted to get in into the actual hedge. This is an example of a jet fuel uh, cross hedge using the NYMEX heating oil future contract. So we're in table five of the paper now, and I just want to read this to you guys. On January 6, 2000, a fuel purchasing director wants to hedge its September jet fuel consumption at current prices. She buys the September New York Harbor heating oil futures contract on the NYMEX, that's the future exchange, at 62 spot 28 cents per gallon. The contract size is of 42,000 gallons. So basically, he's, you know, he's like, all I said, he's like, I need 42,000 gallons of, of heating oil. And the future says, okay, no problem. We can get that for you at 62 spot 28. And on the same day, the New York jet fuel spot price is 80 spot 28 per gallon. So what does he do? He closes out his future contract on August 29, 2000. So he bought January 6th, closed out August 28th, um, nine months later almost exactly. And now we're looking at a profit of 32 spot 31 cents per gallon on the futures contract. So what happened? If you look, we're going to see more now in detail of the example here. So what happened was that the spot price of jet fuel on August 29th was 103 spot 6. 
and without the future hedge, the director would have paid 23.32 cents a gallon more for the fuel. However, using the futures contract and purchasing jet fuel in the spot market, the gain of 32 spot 31 on the futures offset the 23 spot 32 increase in the jet fuel price. So basically, all we're saying, we decided, we, dec we agreed to buy um, jet fuel on January 6th, we, did, we made a contract with the exchange to buy jet fuel on August 29th. So we said, listen, when you can 42,000 uh, 42, gallons of jet fuel to be delivered on August 29th, exactly nine months from today. And they said, okay, well, the price, the nine-month future price right now is 66 spot 28. That's just the going price, the market, right here. Now... August 29th rolls around and you get your delivery you're like yeah you know listen let me get the 42,000 gallons like we agreed the price is 62 spot 28 okay no problem what's your gain or loss well right now the market for this heating oil is trading at 98.59 things change listen before it was 66.3 but now the economy is crazy Middle East is crazy so the price is now 98.59. So what's going on? You record a gain. Why do you record a gain? Because you're getting cheaper heating oil in this case than anybody else. Everybody else right now, today, on August 29, 2000, is getting heating oil at 98.59. And you got heating oil at 66. So why do you gain? Because look, what happens? What happens if you got this? You got this uh, heating oil with the forty-two thousand gallons. You got it for sixty-six point two eight. You go to the market and you sell it right away. You don't wait for it. You're like, I have forty-two thousand gallons of heating oil. I can sell it at a profit of thirty-one cents. So immediately you realize the profit on it. Because you could just go ahead. You don't even have to take delivery. You don't even take delivery. You just go in the market, in the futures market, and you sell this contract there. And it gets canceled out. So in a way, this is the way we hedge these things out. We agree to buy something in the future. Depending on where the price ends up falling out on the date of delivery, compared to the original contract price, the 98 versus 66, that's our gain or loss. And what would happen if they didn't hedge? Now look at it, say, I never hedged. I never hedged. Okay, so you needed to get the jet fuel. Guess what? You're going to get it, but at a much more expensive price. And that's where, and that's where you had a gain of 32.31 on the future, right? And you had basically an expense rising of 23.32 on your actual purchasing of jet fuel. So in this case, the hedge worked, and if you didn't have the hedge, you would have been decimated with increased expenses. So in a way, if you go back, this is like the example of why we, you know, how we hedge effectively, and how we how we make it work. Okay. So in the next video, I'm gonna go over on what is the difference between a cash flow hedge and a fair value hedge. So opening up, guys, I wanted to continue with. Actually, now looking at the 2001 annual report of Southwest, the main thing that we are going to be focused on here, really like a lot of the questions that I asked you guys in Blackboard about the case study, and again, like I said, those questions are just designed for you guys to go through the case study in terms of doing accounting research. For those of you guys putting together the PowerPoint, presenting the PowerPoint in class, it needs to be more like a business presentation that is designed to say, hey, did the hedge work? You know, what happened to the income statement? What happened to the business because of the hedge? So the questions are accounting research questions designed for you to accumulate enough data so that you're able to make a determination of what was the impact of the hedge on the business. Okay, so to go through that accounting research, We'll, we really have to zoom in 100% on this footnote number nine in the financial statements, in the financial statement footnotes. 
So footnote number nine, I'm going to start reading it. Airline operators are inherently dependent upon energy to operate and therefore are impacted by the changes in jet fuel prices. Jet fuel and oil consumed in 2001, 2000, and 1999 represent approximately 15.6%, 17.4%, and 12.5% of Southwest operating expenses, respectively. So this, is, this piece is very important because it starts giving you a perspective on what's going on here. So if their jet fuel was 15% or 16% of their expenses, if jet fuel cost doubles, then it goes to 32% of the expense. So sort of start thinking, like, start thinking about it in reality, like what happens if you run this business? You're like, wait, we might go from, if oil goes from 25 to 50, and we just went from 15% to 30%. So that's one thing to, to start to become uh, aware of. The company endeavors to acquire jet fuel at the lowest possible prices. Because jet fuel is not traded on an organized future exchange, liquidity for hedging is limited. However, the company has found that both crude oil and heating oil contracts are effective commodities for hedging jet fuel. This is like, you know, a, you'll see a page of this in the case study itself. It's called basis risk when you're trying to hedge something, but you, you can't quite hedge the same thing due to liquidity issues. In other words, Jet fuel is a pretty sort of unique commodity itself. It's refined a little bit differently than, than other oil. So there's, you know, the future exchanges don't really trade on it. So what Southwest is talking about is that they're saying, listen, we don't really have access to large amounts of derivatives regarding this specific piece. So we found another commodity that's highly correlated in price to jet fuel which is crude oil and heating oil, which is widely traded and widely available on the future exchanges. So this is just, but there's an issue because there's a correlation breakdown between these prices sometimes, and that risk is called basis risk, although the correlation is usually very, very tight. So there's no risk there, but we're, we're just, you'll see a little bit more on this. The company has financial derivative instruments in the form of the types of hedges that utilizes to decrease exposure to jet fuel price increases. The company does not purchase or hold any derivative financial instruments for trading purposes. So they're talking about their strategy now. You know, none of this stuff that they're doing is for speculation. None of this stuff is for financial speculation. It's all related to hedging an asset they already have. In other words, I want to buy a couple million dollars worth of jet fuel. I'm just sweating the risk. I'm like, listen, if the price doubles, like this is gonna be crazy. I'm not gonna be able to afford it. So they're, listen, if the price goes up, I just wanna be even. So it's not like they're trying to, you know, do anything but a simple hedge of a price increase. The company utilizes financial derivative instruments for both short-term and long-term time frames when it appears the company can take advantage of market conditions. At December 31, 2001, the company had a mixture, a mixture of purchase call options, collar structures, and fixed price swap agreements in place to hedge approximately 60% of its 2002 total anticipated jet fuel requirements, approximately 47% of its 2003 total anticipated jet fuel requirements, and a small portion of its 2004 and 2005 total anticipated jet fuel requirements. So we're starting to see a little bit more into what the company has been up to. It looks like they've been very busy in terms of structuring out derivatives that hedge out future exposure. So it looks like even though you're right now reading a report that was created back in 2001, they've already purchased and put on their balance sheet derivative instruments that um, hedge out 60% of exposure of future jet fuel purchases in a year and 47% of jet fuel purchases that are two years from now. So, and as you're seeing here, I mean like remember the chart, if the chart from 2000 to 2002 was straight up. So as they're heading into all this volatility, and of course these decisions are based on economic research, talking to oil experts, we are trying to see, hey, you know, we're gonna head into some volatility, let's hedge that out. 
so you could see how much it pegs out and it's a part I want you to focus on in this footnote so that you understand how to look at next year's reports and try to identify, oh, did we make money from these reports? So the next thing in the next video, I'm going to go over, okay, we hedged, but what is the profitability of the hedge? And we're going to look at the numbers. Continuing with the numbers, I want to get into the profitability part of what's going on here. It says here, 2001, 2099, the company recognized gains in fuel and oil expense of 79.9 million, 113.5 million, and 14.8 million in terms of uh, respectively from hedging activities at December 31, 2001 and 2000, approximately 8.2 million and 49.9 million respectively were due from third parties from expired derivative contracts. So two things. This is how much income is being recognized when the hedge occurred, when the hedge worked, and when the gain was recognized. This is more of a cash flow. You know, when you make some money on the future, you basically, the bank or the, the exchange will pay you what, what they owe you. You know, and that's sort of, sometimes it's not exactly all profit. It depends on timing. That's the money you're basically getting cash. But this here is the actual income. So what I want you guys to look at, you know, when you say, hey, listen, we made 100 million on a hedge, what does that mean? What does 100 million mean on a hedge? And this is where you want to look at the income statement of Southwest. And, you know, you look at the income statement for a minute here. You know, say we're looking at 2001, 2000. What's the, what's the operating income here? What's the, what's the net income? You know, the net income is ranging here from 500 million, this is, this is in thousands, from 470 million to 500 million. So you're talking about, about adding 113 million to the bottom line out of 500 million, you're, you're talking about increasing your income by 20%. So that's 20% in income. And you were able to increase your income by 20% by taking out this additional fuel expense, right? So I want you guys to start looking in the case study will ask you, what is the, this is the 2001 financial statements, what about 2002, because we hedged 40% or 60% of our exposure in 2002, and we hedged 47% of our exposure for 2003. So I'm kind of asking you, hey, open up the report, open up 2002, open up 2003, which I gave you guys, and inside of that report, find out, what, oh, how much money do we recognize in the future? in terms of the hedges that we put on back now. So I want you guys to look and see were the hedges effective in the future and what was their impact on the financial statement. And start getting a, a feel, a real feel, on what is happening to net income, right? So that's, that's sort of in the accounting realm, in the accounting research of you know accumulating enough data to get an understanding of what's going on here. Then, if you look back and you sort of look at the current events, uh, if you Google Southwest hedging or Southwest hedging strategy, a lot of business case studies come up because this was they sort of executed a financial sort of a financial uh, theory concept in in reality. So a lot of people have studied this because it's financial theory applied properly. So it's very interesting. But if you look at it and see what happened with them, you start seeing that Southwest didn't stop there. They didn't stop there. They decided to use this money, to use this advantage, to continue to cut prices while improving quality. So they really put a lot of other airlines at a tough spot. Other airlines, they don't have money, you know, their planes are late, and you know, they don't, we don't know what's going on, stuff is just falling apart. These guys, they have the money to reduce the fares. Now that is a power move because you know you have the extra money because you made some good bets and now you're using that to get market share because you're strong enough to continue to cut prices. Obviously, um, the airline industry has become purely commoditized, so you can do that. You know, you can do that because there's absolutely no um, sort of brand awareness anymore in airlines. So it's just like everybody goes and finds the cheapest airline. Boom! So you get a better price and you grab more market share, you could see now 
the whole cycle of how, okay, you executed this financial concept, you know, you made some bets, but now you're coming in and you're using that leverage to accumulate strength in the market. So this is going to, you know, you keep in mind that you made a good financial move, and now you're using the financial move for, for business growth and business strength. And that sort of goes back to the other values, which is, you know, if you're successful in the very, very details, if you're successful in just getting people there on time, you know, and having them have a good time for the lowest amount of money possible, then you have a successful business. You know, and that means never losing a bet, you know, and that's a lot of details. That's a lot of hard work, a lot of detail. You could see how that moves into the rest of the company, even when you're dealing with corporate finance and also a lot of detail and a lot of thought has to go into this and you know taking the right risk at the right time has created this, this really successful company and I think it's still successful now 50 years down the line from when this all happened so I yeah, hope you guys enjoy this case study I'm looking forward to seeing your presentation in class and, um, and I'm looking forward to giving you comments on your, on all your presentations I'll see you guys soon